My father was a policeman, started on the beat uh, in Hampshire, and he was a very ambitious and intelligent policeman, and he therefore got promoted roughly every two years of my life, which meant I had to move schools every two years. And my mother was a secretary who, because we had to move every two years, she had to change her job every two years. Um, but her job always, I'm afraid, in those days, as was life was like that, her job always had to come second to my father's. I think I went to something like nine schools in my school life. And um, in my last grammar school, I'd only been there a year, and it was time to work out what you wanted to do. And the career's advice was to become a domestic science teacher. Well, if you spoke to my husband, um, you might consider that rather funny. Um, but um, that was really the height of their amb ambitions for me. I decided I wanted to go to university. And for some reason, I have no idea to this day why I decided I fancied the idea of Oxford. And the school made it absolutely plain that they didn't really think I was university material, let alone Oxbridge. And I was told that whereas other people, favoured pupils, were given extra tuition, I would receive none of it, and I was left completely adrift. And then I chose St Hughes College, Oxford, because it was my father's first name, Hugh. <laughs> I had that little guidance and help, and it was just sheer, it was fate. Law, I think that might be partly my father. Um, he used to review books. And looking back on it, uh, there were an awful lot of um, books that had some kind of legal bent. There were a lot of Henry Cecil books. So I always credit Henry Cecil with having um, led to my becoming a lawyer. And I think I got the taste for it. And on the day I was called to the bar, my father confessed that he'd always wanted to be a barrister, but hadn't told me till then, which I thought was to keep quiet that long um, was quite good. So I suspect it was in my blood. I was extraordinarily fortunate that um, somehow, I think it was partly through my father's job as a police officer in Kent, there was a connection with a barrister in Kent and I managed to end up in a set of chambers where the head of chambers really did believe in equal opportunity for women. Um, he had a very highly intelligent mother um, and he always wanted to promote women. So, And in those days, heads of chambers could do what they like. Unfortunately, he was benign and he just took me in. When I joined the bar, there were still sets of chambers that said we can't have a woman because we haven't got enough loos, or um, we've got one woman, that's plenty. Um, you're a woman, you can't do that kind of work. We can't brief Miss Hallett because she's a woman and our client won't have one. They're all absolutely overt in your face. Sexual harassment, I'm afraid some of that was pretty overt as well. Um, it, Looking back on it, I just I cannot believe that men thought, or some men thought, they could behave in the way that they did. And for many women of my generation, we just bit our lips and said nothing. Um, and so, looking back on it, I wonder should I try to challenge it more? But that wasn't the way we did it. We thought if we kept our heads down, worked, got to be seen, got to be judged on the quality of what we did, that that, that was the way through. I have gone public about one example where I was given a specific promotion appointment to sit somewhere and the senior judge who was responsible made it absolutely plain to me how I could thank him. Um, I had judges or a judge who didn't approve of a working mother and he would deliberately sit uh, 9.30 till 6.30 knowing I had to drive from London uh, for a two hour drive. Um, yeah, there are quite a few instances where judges made it perfectly plain that they, or other barristers made it perfectly plain that um, they didn't think the likes of me should A, be at the bar and B, still at the bar with children. I always felt that because I did take a pride in my appearance, that maybe I might have been taken more seriously if I'd worn some heavy specs and tied my hair back. I, I, I found, and also doing crime, if you do crime and family work, there was always this feeling, certainly at the bar, and I suspect amongst the judiciary, that somehow you weren't quite the same quality of lawyer. Anybody could do crime, anybody could do family. And I, I suppose so, it's the two things really. It's my background professionally and my gender that have made me feel that I'm always fighting to be taken seriously. And so I thought, well, that's not going to stop me doing crime, but I'm going to have to find a way to combat that. So I got involved in bar council politics, partly for that reason and partly because I could never bear just sitting around in a raving and complaining about something. If there was something that needed doing, I wanted to do it. 
So I, I, I got involved for that reason and therefore worked my way up the bar political with the small p ladder. And then I became leader of the South Eastern Circuit, which in those days involved representing discipline, regulation of all the barristers in the South Eastern Circuit. And that then really became a stepping stone to my involvement as vice chairman and then chairman of the bar. I was very proud of that and very proud to lead um, the barristers branch of the profession, especially being the first woman, that, was, that, was, that felt good. When I took over as a coroner into the 7-7 inquest, nothing had happened for uh, uh, five years. The bereaved families were obviously, many of them were distraught that they didn't know what had happened and they just, they needed some kind of closure. And so it was really difficult to gain their confidence. The security services were not surprisingly feeling a little um, worried about how they might get treated. And so there are a number of groups where you had to gain their trust. Um, you had to gain the trust of the public. And so, yes, it was a huge challenge, and I suppose um, coming out of it as we did, um, I had a fantastic team, I really did, and so I, th I think I would put that down as one of the things I look back on with most pride. This is a photograph taken by somebody who said we were meant to be the rising stars at that time of the legal profession. I've had to look back on my life, and I realised that I had mentors in the form of far-sighted men and I had informal support networks with other women. So I've always been close to other women and without my realising it we, we have been doing informally what we now have far greater structure for. Now I lead for diversity for the Lord Chief Justice and we're pursuing a, a whole range of initiatives trying to um, encourage women to come forward and to stay in the profession and then to stay in the profession so that they can get to the senior echelons um, we're trying to, to help them in making applications because women aren't that good at making applications we're trying to train them how to be interviewed because they're not that good um, but a lot of it is just support and encouragement and I'm also trying to do a lot to go out to areas from where traditionally we haven't acquired women from. So general counsel, academics, government legal service, there are a whole mass of women out there that I think could make excellent judges um, that we're trying to target. So I do a lot of work, mainly targeted at getting women into the judiciary, but I also do a fair amount of work with, with getting women into the profession and keeping them in the profession. My advice to a young woman starting out at the bar would be hang in there, do not give up, and if someone tells you you can't do something, ignore them and go on and prove them wrong.